Okay, so I think we are now live. Uh, so hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Um, today, we're extremely excited to welcome Professor Alexi Elfev um, from, uh, from the Nail Institute. Um, and so Alexia will be, of course, known to, to many or most of you. She's an expert in quantum optics and quantum thermodynamics, quantum information, many things. Um, and today she's going to be telling us about something that's a topic very close to my heart, which is the energetic cost of work extraction. I'm super interested to hear about it. Um, so just before I hand over to Alexia, I'll just do the usual thing which I do, which is just explain to any new viewers uh, the format. So basically, um, Alexia is going to have the floor in just a second and she'll speak for as, as long as she likes, sort of 45 minutes to an hour or whatever. And then at the end, we will have a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, um, just please feel free to write them in the YouTube chat window. Um, and I always forget to say this, but I'll remember this today. So we, we like, if you can, please say your name. So if you're if your username on YouTube is already your name, that's fine. If your username is like physicsprof123, then please just, just also say who you are so I know when I'm announcing it. Um, and uh, okay, yeah, and that's, if we have any technical problems, we'll deal, the, deal with them uh, as, as they go, of course, but hopefully uh, we won't have any issues. Um, okay, so that's enough for me. Uh, I'll hand over now to Alexia. Um, please go ahead and you can share your screen, Alexia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. And uh, in general, uh, I want okay. I want to uh, really thank uh, the Doubling Initiative uh, for having this uh, very interesting uh, series of uh, talk open. Um, it's important to keep track of the community, and uh, here you you perfectly manage to create some uh, some spirit despite the, the strange times we are all living in. So uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, another thing is that, uh, well, it's the first time I give a talk online like this and I see absolutely nobody, so uh, it's a bit weird. And uh, maybe I will stop in the middle to take some questions because this talk is going to be, from the quantum optical point of view, it may be a bit technical and I want to make sure that the main messages, they, they, they go through, even if I see nobody. So uh, that's it. So indeed, this is the title, The Energetic Cost of Work Extraction, which is presented in this paper. Here are the main uh, the co-workers of this paper. So Juliette Moncel, uh, who was a former PhD student of mine, who now uh, is a postdoc uh, in Chalmers. Uh, Marco felus Aziani, who is PhD student with me right now. And Benjamin Huard, who is an uh, uh, experimentalist in uh, circuit QED, with whom I have the pleasure to uh, work for a, a few years now. Um, the outline of the talk is the following. So first I will set up the stage and tell you a little bit about uh, work extraction uh, through history. So try to define what uh, we mean by work, which as we all know in quantum thermodynamics is quite a tricky topic. Then I will uh, give you building blocks of uh, what we do with in, in my group about thermodynamics of waveguide QED before going to the I would say the main part of this uh, of this work, which is presenting you uh, a new notion, which is the notion of spontaneous work extraction, which is based on quantum coherence. And I will go to conclusion and outlooks. And as I said before, maybe I will take some time in the middle of the talk to, to ask you if you already have a few questions. Okay, so work extraction. Work extraction, well, we, we kind of know what it is uh, in the good old grandpa framework, which is macroscopic thermodynamics, um, where you have uh, systems that uh, exchange work on the one hand and heat on the other hand. And to differentiate work with respect to heat, what we can use is that work exchange is a change of entropy, a change of energy, sorry, without any change of entropy of the system. So this is pretty interesting to build engines. And in a heat engine, the work extraction is typically the useful stroke where we use the conversion of a defined system to pick up the energy that is inside a bath without uh, picking the entropy that comes with the energy. So uh, the work that is extracted that way uh, from a thermodynamic system, it, there are two solutions. It is either immediately consumed or it is stored into a battery. And when this work is stored into a battery, then we expect it to be reusable, okay? 
So all this is kind of uh, intuitive and goes with the framework of classical thermodynamics, say. Now, if we go in the quantum realm, things are becoming a bit tricky, and we all know that uh, work is kind of controversial, especially when we start uh, dealing with quantum open systems, where uh, quantum system interacts with, uh, well, exchanges heat and work at the same time. Uh, so I would say it's still under progress. But uh, for closed system, I mean system which evolve unitarily, then there is no apparent problem because actually during a unitary transformation, there is no entropy change. So the energy change during a unitary transformation, we can safely claim this is work. And in this mindset, a work extraction, well, it's nothing but lowering the system's energy by a unitary transformation. And the maximal work we can extract by considering all the possible unitary transformation that we can do, this, is, uh, this has a little name, this is called ergotropy. So here are a few equations, but basically summarizing what I just said here, we can define the internal energy of the system like this, which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And then if we apply a unitary map on the system state, we can extract some work which corresponds to the change of internal energy of the system. And this work extracted uh, is not zero if and only if uh, the Hamiltonian that we apply depends on time. So work extraction in that, uh, in that framework, it requires a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Okay, so to fix the ideas, it's, it's nice to consider uh, a qubit and uh, say even more simplest, uh, simpler, a qubit that has been prepared in the excited state. And I write the internal energy of that guy like this. And the goal is to minimize the qubit energy at the end of the unitary transformation. Starting from this, there are two, uh, I would say, typical unitary transformations we can consider to extract all uh, the ergotropy of this qubit. The first one is what I would call classical work extraction. To extract work, I just have to change the energy scale I'm using. So typically, I can reduce the energy of the excited state. And when this energy uh, goes to zero, then um, I have extracted a maximal work. Okay. The other way to extract this work is what I would say the coherent work extraction. Here, uh, the idea is to change the qubit state, the psi of t, unitarily. And if I change my state unitarily, well, there is no other option than creating coherences along the way to go, for instance, from 1 to 0. That's why I call this coherent work extraction. And the maximal work extraction is attained if I do what is usually called the pipers, I go from 1 to 0, and in the same way, I'm going to extract h bar omega 0, which is the ergotropy of the state 1. Okay, so we have with these two typical ways to, to extract work from a qubit. So now there are open questions. We can ask where is this work stored in the end? Because when I model a unitary, Actually, I don't exactly know who performs the unitary on the system because it's a classical modeling. I can also ask how much does it cost to implement such a unitary operation, which is also not modeled in this kind of, uh, of uh, operation I represented before. And also, since I don't model the battery, what tells me that this work can be reused at will? And what is the cost of reusing this work that I have stored? So answering these questions, actually, it requires to model the battery, meaning to model the quantum system that implements the unitary on my qubit and uh, that also stores the extracted work. It works both ways. It performs work and it gets back the work that the system provides. What are the prescription to uh, complete my thermodynamic system and model a battery? What are the prescriptions to build an ideal quantum battery? What I want to do is to describe the system battery as itself an isolated system, where I have the Hamiltonian of the battery, the Hamiltonian of the system, and the coupling Hamiltonian. And ideally, 
I would like this coupling Hamiltonian to be constant, which is what is usually called an autonomous scenario. I don't want a little guy to switch on and off this V. Then I want that uh, the, evolution, the evolution of uh, the system and the battery is not entangling. And why is that so? Because that way I can describe for my reduced system an evolution that remains a unitary. And I can define that way individual energies, separated energy for the system and the battery, such that the mean energy of my system equals the sum of the energy of the battery plus the sum of the energy of the system. And since the whole process here is unitary and my whole system is isolated, uh, what is taken from the battery goes in the system. And that way, I can say that the work exchanged exactly corresponds to the change of energy of my battery. So this has a strong practical advantage because that way I could expect to be able to read work in situ directly inside the battery. So this is an ideal scenario. Uh, can it be realized in practice? So actually, uh, in the case of the classical work extraction, it is possible. You remember I told you to extract work from a qubit, there are two options, the classical and the coherent one. As for the classical one, this corresponds to this reduced Hamiltonian for the qubit. We can build this kind of Hamiltonian uh, by using as a battery uh, what is called a mechanical resonator. So you have a picture here of a device that we, that we study in Grenoble which is a, a nanophotonic trumpet. I'm not entering into the details of this because that's not the point of the, 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 the present talk. It was just to give you a general overview on what kind of batteries we can study potentially experimentally. But as far as classical work extraction is concerned, uh, the proper batteries are provided by uh, mechanical resonators that are coupled to qubit. And this is doable experimentally. So there are a couple of papers uh, that we have proposed where it is possible to measure directly inside the mechanical resonator the work that is exchanged on average and at the single trajectory level to record fluctuation theorems, for instance. So that's for classical work extraction. Again, I won't enter into the details of it because today what I'm interested in is coherent work extraction. So coherent work extraction, what is it? Uh, it's uh, the process by which a qubit basically undergoes Rabi oscillations, right? That's a coherent work exchange in the case of a qubit. This corresponds to this Hamiltonian applied on the qubit, where this quantity here is actually a resonant electromagnetic field that is induced by the exchange of photons with a well-defined electromagnetic field again. So this process of classical Rabi, of, uh, Rabi oscillation, it's actually the basis of most quantum heat engines and quantum Maxwell's demon that have been studied in the literature, both uh, theoretically and experimentally. If uh, you look at work exchange, quantum work exchange in this kind of paper, what you will see is the exchange of photons with the field inside the cavity or with the driving field. Oh, that's, that's a basic, important, very important mechanism. And so in this mindset, the battery, the system that implements this Hamiltonian on the qubit, it's a cavity mode that is resonant with the qubit. So to enter a little bit more into the equations, here's the, here's the, the game. We have the qubit as our working substance, the battery is a resonant mode of the electromagnetic field, the, cube, the coupling Hamiltonian, as always in quantum optics, this is a good old James Cummings Hamiltonian, where omega zero is called the vacuum Rabi frequency, A is the lowering operator in the cavity mode, sigma, sigma is uh, the lowering operator of the qubit, and we consider as the initial battery state a coherent field that has been injected in the, in the cavity. 
What we know from quantum optics is that in the classical limit, meaning when uh, alpha goes to infinity, then uh, the evolution between the qubit and the field is non-entangling by definition. Actually, it's a definition of classicality in quantum optics. And the, eff the effective Hamiltonian that is seen by the qubit exactly corresponds that to the Hamiltonian that I was proposing before. So that's the Hamiltonian that implements, induces on the qubit the, the Rabi oscillation. And since the qubit and the battery is an isolated system where energy is conserved, then the work exchange exactly corresponds in principle to the battery's energy change. So it looks good. It looks like the ideal case we want to, to, to use to study more properly uh, work extraction. But now what happens if uh, the number of photons inside the cavity mode is not large, meaning the amplitude of the coherent field is not infinite. Then what we have during the interaction, we have an entangling evolution. We build up uh, a field qubit entanglement. And because of this entanglement, the field and the qubit reduced state lose purities. And because of this lack of purity, uh, we cannot say that the energy between the two guys, it is exchanged as work. Because work, as we saw before, this is exchange, uh, this is expected to be a change of energy that doesn't touch the entropy. So we are a bit stuck in that, uh, in that story. And um, why is that so? What we are realizing here is that actually ideality, it has an energetic cost. The ideal battery for coherent work extraction, it can be only realized in the classical limit where alpha and the number of photons is very large. So it corresponds basically to some infinite initial battery's charge. So this raises two kinds of questions. First one of fundamental uh, level, classicality and unitarity, they seem to require infinite energetic resources. And the question is, can we really quantify the cost that is associated to these uh, energetic resources? And the second uh, question is practical. The work exchanges, they can't be really measured. They can be detected in a battery that has an infinite initial charge. So can we design a protocol where we could have observable work exchanges? So actually, that's, that's the program of uh, what I'm going to present now to answer these questions. The first thing that I'm going to do is to propose a realistic scenario for coherent work extraction. And the idea to do that is to switch from cavity quantum electrodynamics to something that is called waveguide electrodynamics, where, well, instead of dealing with the cavity, we deal with the waveguide, so as we are going to, to see now. The prescriptions uh, for the battery are like this. We still want the battery and the qubit to be an isolated system in an autonomous scenario. We want uh, work to be a measurable quantity in the battery. And we want uh, that if some work is stored in the battery, it should be reusable. So we are going to introduce this notion of um, how to define work in a really operational way, not just by looking at the working substance, but looking at the battery in which the work is extracted. And the strategy that we are going to apply is so we are going, once we have understood properly what work means in this framework, we are going to define and study the performances of the work extraction process. And this as a function of two parameters. The first one is the initial charge of the battery. And the second one is the initial coherence injected in the qubit. And as we are going to see, this can be seen as two complementary resources. So that's, that's the program. So now I come to the, to the second part of the talk, which is uh, this thermodynamics of, of wavelength QED. So what is, a, what is the scenery that we are going to focus on now? We are going to focus on a qubit, who is this guy here, that is embedded in a waveguide. And the waveguide, basically, it it's, can be seen as a reservoir of electromagnetic modes that are prepared at zero temperature. 
So basically, instead of just playing with a single mode as it was the case before, single resonant mode, we are going to play with a continuum of modes. In this reservoir, actually the qubit uh, can undergo spontaneous emission with a rate gamma, but uh, so it looks like a bath at zero temperature, but it's a bit more than a bath because in this waveguide, I can also input a field that will propagate, that's the input field, talk to the qubit and uh, get out, that's the output field. So I'm going also to be able to describe the scattering of an input field by my two-level system. And I'm going to consider uh, what we call the semi-classical situation, because basically uh, in the input-output framework, I could describe any kind of input field, but I'm going to simplify my life and just consider a coherent wave packet. So if you remember what I said before, I looked at a coherent field that was injected in a cavity mode. Here I'm looking at a coherent wave packet that is injected in the waveguide. So it's a, it's same spirit. This coherent wave packet, I'm going to describe it by its complex amplitude that corresponds to the average value of uh, the input field operator. And this allows me to define the rate of photons uh, that are going to uh, impinge on the qubit, n dot of t, that is the modulus squared of this uh, beta in of t. Okay? Here you have a few pictures uh, to tell you that actually these waveguides coupled to qubits, this is not science fiction. Uh, people in the experimental room, they do this every day. That's again the photonic trumpet I showed you before which is a marvelous battery, uh, not only a classical one, but uh, actually here I can also inject an input field and uh, measure an output field with here a qubit that is a quantum dot uh, at the bottom. Here, this is a micro pillar, uh, same idea. This is actually a waveguide for light that will perfectly talk to the quantum dot that is here uh, in the heart of the pillar. And this is a scheme for circuit QED where you have a qubit that is coupled to a superconducting waveguide with an input field and an output field. So all these systems here, they uh, realize this ideal situation. Okay, so what now? Now, when you have this uh, qubit coupled to a waveguide, there are two things that you need to describe. That is the evolution of the qubit on the one hand and the evolution of the light well, of the input and output field, on the other hand. As far as the qubit is concerned, it follows the standard optical block equations, uh, meaning that uh, its evolution is governed by a unitary on the one hand, uh, that follows a rabiocidation, and by a non-unitary on the other hand, which is the spontaneous emission we, we saw before. As far as the Rabi oscillation is concerned, the Rabi frequency depends on the number of photons I'm going to send, on the rate of photons I'm going to send, uh, with the following uh, equality here. And this allows me to define basically two different regimes. When uh, the rate of photons is much larger than the spontaneous emission rate, then it means that I am in the stimulated regime of the block equations, and it basically means that I'm going to be able to neglect stimulated, uh, that I'm going to be able to neglect the spontaneous emission, and my uh, evolution it will be a unitary. On the other hand, if I send very, very few photons in my input field, then it's basically the spontaneous emission that will describe the evolution of my system, and the switch between the two regimes, it takes place when I just send one photon per lifetime of my qubit, which is very few, which is typical of the one-dimensional geometry where I know that any single photon I send in my waveguide will talk to the two-level system and induce a rabi oscillation on my two-level system. Okay, so it's, it's really typical of 1D geometry. So that's for the qubit. Now, for the field, 
So the evolution of the field, it's uh, managed by, by what is called the input-output equation. And my output field, basically, is a sum of two terms. It, uh, with the first is the input field. And the input field, like I said before, it's a coherent wave packet. Plus the small field that is radiated by the dipole of the qubit. And this small field that you see here, it has a coherent component, which is basically the average uh, value of the dipole of the qubit, and an incoherent component that uh, corresponds to the fluctuations. Okay? All this standard quantum optics. And now the game is to translate all these well-known quantum optics into energetic terms and then into thermodynamic terms. We can play the energetic analytics of this. And to do this, we just have to write down the energy of the qubit and write down the radiated power, the power radiated by the qubit, uh, which has two components. One component that corresponds to the spontaneous emission and one component that corresponds to the stimulated emission. If you want to remember spontaneous versus stimulated, it's just one is ruled by gamma and the other one by omega. Okay. On the other hand, we can write down uh, the power uh, that is um, uh, the increase of power of the waveguide. And if we play that game, what we find is that we find this equation basically, uh, which is quite simple. It tells you that what is radiated by the qubit will increase the power propagating in the waveguide. So it's just energy conservation in the end of the day. It tells me that everything that is spit by the qubit will propagate in the waveguide afterwards. It tells you that the qubit waveguide is an, is an isolated system. There is energy conservation in there. And it also tells us that the input field is responsible for a unitary component in the qubit evolution. Why is that nice? Because actually, we are having the prescription for the battery. So if I summarize what we saw, on the waveguide side, we have a guide that drives the qubit, that collects the radiated field. And on the qubit side, we have spontaneous emission, and a coherent drive by the wave packet. This tells me that I'm going to be able to define my waveguide as my battery. Uh, my realistic battery, realistic because, uh, because as I told you, uh, there are a few experimentalists that are able to uh, measure the output field in that kind of system, input and output field in that kind of system. So once I have this uh, last bit of work before I can go to the results, I need to define what I'm going to call work. Um, there are two ways to proceed. One is well known by the community. It's look at what's going on on the qubit side uh, based on the master equation. As we know, it's challenging and uh, the community has still hasn't really reached a consensus about the definitions of heat and work uh, in all possible situations of a quantum open system. So here I, I mentioned a, a recent work that we have realized uh, in particular with Massimiliano Esposito on the thermodynamics of optical block equations that put another brick uh, in the current debate uh, to define work uh, from, from first principles. But in that uh, presentation, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to choose an operational approach of work that is based on the batteries observable. So instead of looking at the quantum open system here, I'm going to look at what's going on in the battery. And I'm going to uh, claim that I should define work as the guy that can be reused to drive another system. And actually, from quantum optics, I know that this corresponds to the coherent fraction of the field that is radiated by the qubit. So this allows me to go back to the definition of uh, the input-output equation I told you before. As I told you, the output field equals the input field 
plus the field that is radiated by the, di by the dipole to define the work rate, actually the work extracted, I'm going to take the average values of this input-output equation, which is a relation between coherent field's amplitude and the work weight will correspond to the energy of the, uh, of, sorry, of B out modulus square minus beta in modulus square. The equations talk better than me, I guess. If I use this equation and input this, I have the following expression for the work rate. The work rate, uh, it solely involves uh, the mean value of the dipole uh, as a function of time. And um, this can be measured, so this actually was measured uh, in the circuit QD framework um, by using a heterodyning scheme. And the interesting thing with that, uh, with that rate is that uh, work, as you can see, not only has uh, a stimulated component that scales like the Rabi frequency, but it also has a spontaneous component that comes from the 1D geometry. And this is very specific. And, um, and as we are going to see uh, in a few minutes, this uh, is very important to see the impact of quantum coherence on work extraction. Okay, I've defined work. Uh, now with energy conservation, it's easy to, def uh, to define heat. Heat will be the increase of the battery's energy that is carried by the incoherent noise. So it's the incoherent fraction of the radiated field that is quantified to define the heat rate. And this is this quantity here, uh, this, which corresponds to a, a rate of fluctuations. Okay, so here is the thermodynamic protocol that we are going to consider now to extract results from these uh, scenarios. Um, so I have a qubit that I'm going to prepare at the initial time in a well-defined state. Uh, that is characterized by some initial energy, some initial coherence, and some initial ergotropy. And uh, I'm going to couple this qubit to a battery uh, that is characterized by a certain spontaneous emission rate, a certain uh, pulse, input pulse, and a certain initial charge uh, of, uh, that corresponds to a certain number of photons in my pulse. For the three different scenarios, I'm going to compute the rate of extracted work that I recall the expression here. And I'm going to study work extraction, again, as a function of the initial battery's charge, meaning as a function of the initial number of photons, as a function of the initial coherence of the qubit, and for three different scenarios. What are these three scenarios? The first one will be a non-autonomous one, uh, but uh, that will uh, have the advantage to reconnect to some intuitions we had before. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, an external operator that control the, the coupling to the waveguide and keep the rate of photon constant. So it's basically a monochromatic uh, excitation that I'm going to send on the qubit. And then I will consider two autonomous scenarios where the coupling to the waveguide will be constant and the battery initially uncharged before considering a pulse scenario where the coupling is constant and uh, a pulse is going to stimulate the emission of the qubit. So that's, uh, that's the program. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm talking a bit too much, but uh, well. Um, OK, so what, what are the results of this study? So in the first scenario, so what I'm going to do is to prepare my qubit in this state here, uh, which is represented in the, in the block ball by this dot here, which is characterized by some initial energy here, some initial coherence, the maximal coherence corresponding to the case where my qubit is prepared in the plus x state, I mean somewhere on the equator of the block sphere, and the initial ergotropy of my system uh, that can be written as well, and that exactly corresponds to the initial energy for pure state. 
Okay. And this plot here presents you the ergotropy of the qubit state for the different points in the block ball with maximal ergotropy here and null ergotropy in the case of the passive states that are here. So the game that I'm playing first, as I said, is the non-autonomous scenario. So I'm going to have a continuous excitation of my, uh, of my qubit, and I'm going to control the time of interaction with uh, my continuous excitation. And uh, like I said before, when the rate of photons is much larger than the spontaneous emission rate, I'm reaching the, the stimulated regime of block equations where uh, my evolution is a unitary. What I want to have is extract maximal work. So I'm going to uh, optimize the time of interaction so that the maximal work is extracted. And this is typically the plot that you see here, where we plot the maximal work extracted for uh, this uh, theta angle that characterizes the initial state. And for this, uh, there's a dot here, uh, for this value of the, of the photon rate. So what can we see first? We can see that for a fixed value of theta, meaning for a fixed initial state of my qubit, when I increase the rate of photons, I increase the work extracted. And uh, the maximal extraction is reached in the stimulated regime where actually I'm building a unitary operation. So the stimulated emission regime, it maximizes the work extraction, which makes sense. And in this stimulated regime where I reach unitary evolution, I have then realized the ideal case and the work that I extract exactly corresponds to the ergotropy of my qubit. So I have made a cut of the 2D plot that you were seeing on the slide before, where I plot the work extracted as a function of the photon rate. As you can see, the optimal work extracted increases as a function of the number of photons I send as a unit of time, with here, in the case of the stimulated regime, these two situations, when theta equals pi, then this corresponds to the pi pulse. I'm inducing the transformation E becomes G, and I extract one photon of energy H bar omega zero. So this corresponds to a single photon amplifier. And here, when theta equals pi over two, then I realize plus gives me G, and I extract H bar omega no divided by two. One important result that I will not demonstrate, but that is in the paper, is that the extracted work is always upper bounded by the ergotropy. So whichever the regime I am uh, in, uh, stimulated, spontaneous, whatever, in between, I cannot extract more work than the ergotropy that is initially in my system. And this allows me to define the process yield that corresponds to the work extracted divided by the initial ergotropy of the qubit. And this yield, I can also plot it, again, as a function of the photon rate. And as you can see, I reach a yield of one in the stimulated emission regime, which uh, again makes sense. And this actually, and this is the, the first important message, that corresponds to a large initial battery charge. Because now that I've modeled my battery, I'm able to count how much energy I need to realize a unitary operation. And given, uh, div given the, the order of magnitudes I'm playing with, this means that I should have a large initial battery charge so that I'm able to implement a unitary transformation. So this kind of quantifies the cost of unitarity I had promised in the beginning of the talk. Um, but the nice thing with this study is that we can also see that work extraction and non-zero yield, they are also possible if I put no energy at all in my battery. This is typically what's happening here. Here, I almost send no photons, and as you can see, I can still extract work, and I can still have here some yield to my protocol while I'm inputting nothing. But the condition is that there should be some initial coherence in the qubit. 
and this is something that I'm going to detail more now, by considering the second scenario, which is autonomous and spontaneous. So the idea is that I prepare my qubit is in a well-defined state that potentially contains some coherence, and the qubit spontaneously emits a field in the waveguide and ends up in the ground state. Um, in this situation, the work extracted, it has only one term that corresponds to the spontaneous con component of work, which is a big novelty because it basically tells us that a non-driven system, so a system that receives no work, can produce work. And if you integrate this equation, it shows you that actually the work extracted is directly related to the initial amount of coherence that was put in the qubit. And this shows that actually quantum coherence, it can be seen as a resource that compensates for the low battery charge. So it's a complementary resource for work extraction. So these are actually the big messages. And, and the idea now is to understand a bit better why coherence matter and why it allows to extract work even if the system receives no work in the first place. Um, as I defined in the beginning, in this framework, work is the energy that is carried by the coherent component of the radiated field. If the qubit is prepared in this initial state, which is a coherent superposition of G and E, it is going to emit uh, to radiate a field that is also a coherent superposition of 0 and 1, where uh, 0 and 1, they are uh, Fox states for a well-defined, um, 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 sorry, for a well-defined mode, which is the output mode. Now, this psi out, this field that is radiated, the idea it, is that it partially overlaps with a coherent field. So it has a coherent component. And the phase of this coherent field that is emitted by the qubit, um, it, it is set by the, by the phase of the coherent superposition uh, that, was the, that the qubit was initially prepared in. So it's pretty different from the stimulated regime where the phase of the emitted field is set by the driving field. Here, that's the fact that the the qubit initially carries some coherence with a well-defined phase that allows it to emit a field which also has a phase. So, in pictures, maybe it's better. This is what is called the Uzimi function of this emitted field in the waveguide. Uh, for different uh, initial angles of the qubits, so this is the field that is emitted by the qubit if it is initially prepared in the ground state. So uh, in that case, nothing happens. And uh, the field emitted by the qubit is basically the vacuum. If the qubit is prepared in a coherent superposition equally weighted between E and G, so theta equals pi over two, this is the typical Uzimi function of the field that is radiated by the qubit. And this is the Uzimi function if the qubit is initially prepared in the excited state. So, to summarize here, the work corresponds to the energy that is carried by the coherent component of this field where we see the Uzimi function here. So it can be written in that way. And the yield, it basically compares this extracted work to the total energy of the field. And by keeping these two definitions in mind, it is easy to understand the next slide. First, we look at what's going on when theta equals zero. When theta equals zero, like I said, the qubit basically emits the vacuum in the waveguide. It emits zero photon, so it corresponds to no work extraction or a very, very little one. But at the same time, the efficiency of the process tends to one. Why? Because it corresponds to the maximal overlap with the coherent field. So the very little radiation that is emitted by the qubit when theta goes to zero it actually corresponds to the field that corresponds the most uh, to a coherent field. So only work is emitted by the qubit at this, uh, at this stage. When theta equals pi over two, then you can write down the equation and actually find that it corresponds to the maximal uh, work possible 
possible work extraction, and this is because there is maximal coherence in the qubit. And if the qubit is initially excited, then uh, both the yield and the work, they are zero. And why is that so? It's because single photons that are emitted there, they have no phase. So in other words, for uh, quantum opticians, it means that single photon sources, they produce no work in the thermodynamic sense that we have defined. So uh, to briefly conclude on this spontaneous scenario, uh, this should have convinced you that in this spontaneous regime, the work extraction and the yield, they cannot be simultaneously optimized because the yield is optimized when the emitted field looks like a coherent field, but this can only be done if there is no energy in the field. And this uh, is summarized here, where you see actually the work extracted here and the yield here, uh, sorry. Well, no, the yield is not plotted. Anyway, you get, you get what I meant. Um, so here is a brief summary of these two scenarios. We started from this initial qubit state and we have considered what is the maximal amount that we can extract in the stimulated regime. And what we saw is that it entirely relies on the battery's energy. We need to have the maximal uh, battery's energy to maximize the work extraction. And the work extraction and the yield, they are maximized together in that uh, case. And the mechanism behind is that the phase of the emitted field is set by the drive. On the other hand, there is also the spontaneous regime where the battery is initially uncharged. And then the work extraction entirely relies on the qubit's coherence. And the work extracted and the yield, they are maximized for different parameters and the phase is set by the qubit's initial coherence. And now the question that I want to ask to, to conclude this talk is, uh, can we consider an intermediate scenario? And this is what we did by looking at what's happening if instead of sending nothing in the waveguide, we send a pulse that is characterized by a well-defined amount uh, number of photons in a square pulse. And then uh, we suppose, uh, for simplicity again, that the qubit's initial state is plus theta. And we look at the work extraction and the yield for various initial charge of the battery and various theta. So this is what you can uh, observe here. That's the work extracted. And here you can observe the yield uh, again as a function of theta and the charge of the battery here. Um, so to simplify the, the reading, we see that actually there are three regimes that allow to maximize or optimize work extraction and yield. The regime three uh, that corresponds to the maximal number of photons in the pulse or a large number of photons in the pulse, this corresponds to the stimulated regime one where the number of photons in the pulse is very low corresponds to the spontaneous regime and two is the intermediate regime that I'm going to tell you about. And the white areas here, they correspond to negative work extraction. So they, they correspond to useless heaters where I send work and I, where work is only absorbed and re-emitted as heat. Okay, so here is a cut of the work and the yield uh, as a function of theta, for the three different uh, typical numbers of, of photons in the pulse I told you about. So scenario one, it corresponds to a charge of uh, 10 to the minus three photons, so it's basically a spontaneous scenario, and you can see the work extraction, extracted and the yield as a function of theta. Uh, as we saw before, work and yield are not optimized simultaneously, and work is, uh, is maximized with the maximal coherence, so for theta equals pi over two, and the yield is maximized when theta equals zero, so this really corresponds to the case we saw before. Now, stimulated regime, case number three, this is reached for n bar equals 22. Work and heat, they can be simultaneously optimized, and this corresponds basically to theta equals pi, more or less, and we could really reach the maximal values, but for this, uh, we would need to optimize also the time of interaction to come back to the first scenario of the beginning of the talk. And then we have the intermediate regime uh, that actually is interesting because we have the interplay between uh, coherence and uh, the battery's charge, the qubit's coherence and the battery's charge to optimize work extraction. 
And uh, yeah, so here are a few figures uh, that I will not comment, but I j just want to mention that here, again, it's interesting because we have the contribution of the two resources uh, to optimize the extraction of work. Okay, so I come now to the conclusions, and I spoke a long time. I'm sorry about that. I had not uh, made the chrono. <laughs> um, so in this talk, I've presented a new approach of work, which is based on the batteries observable, building on the fact that we can describe the battery or reasonable battery. And for this, I proposed an operational definition of work that corresponds to the coherent fraction of the field that is radiated by the qubit. And this work can be used to drive another qubit. So I would say this is work under progress uh, right now uh, with people in my group. Um, we have seen that um, there are two possible uh, options in this scenario. Either we have a large charging energy and then we can rely on simulated emission and the phase of the output field is set by the input field. Or we have a large initial coherence in the qubit. We don't need that much charging energy. This relies on spontaneous emission and the phase of the output field is set by the quantum qubits phase. And the, again, the battery's energy and the qubit's coherence, they are two com complementary resources for work extraction. So a few outlooks now. Uh, first of all, uh, the experiments are planned. They are planned on two different experimental platforms, one in integrated photonics in the group of Pascal Senelard and one with superconducting qubits uh, in the group of Benjamin Huard. And as I briefly mentioned within the talk, there are theoretical fo follow-ups that are currently explored by uh, Maria, Patrice, uh, and uh, Cyril um, that aim at translating the input-output formalism I just presented you into a collisional model, because a collisional model is perfectly fitted to do thermodynamics. And the idea is to build up a consistent thermodynamical interpretation of waveguide QED. And so I thank you for your attention. Uh, here are the people I'm, I'm lucky enough to collaborate with. And now I can, I can take questions. I didn't take questions in the beginning. Um, voila. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alexia. Um, super clear. Cheers. Um, so we've had lots of questions already, so that's great. So I don't think we're gonna we're gonna lack for questions. Um, but anyone who has any further questions, of course, please feel free to, to write them in. It's always good to have more questions. So um, let me go through them um, kind of from the from from the beginning. Okay. So we had a question. Um, we have several questions from Jun Jae Liu. The first one was close to the beginning of the talk. Um, so the question was, how can it be possible to have a constant V while its average vanishes? A constant V while its average vanishes. Uh, so uh, do you have any idea of uh, the slide yeah, uh, I mean, it was, was referring really to? Close to the beginning. I, I, so, yeah. yeah, so it was for the prescription for an ideal quantum battery. Indeed. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. So, uh, so the V can be constant, but its average value can be zero. It depends on in which state you, you do the average value. Right. So that, that's the trick. And indeed here, I remain very general, but uh, you can have examples of this behavior if you look at the batteries for classical work extraction I mentioned uh, with the optomechanical systems. We very clearly see the, that the, the, the coupling switches on and off in a fully autonomous manner. It all relies on the free evolution of the states. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, the next question also from Junjie was, uh, what will happen if one considers an ensemble of two level systems within the waveguide? Aha, uh -huh. that's a nice follow up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yet, but uh, certainly we'll have to take into account phenomena like super radiance and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that will also be interesting to, to, to consider. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I'm already having headaches just to make sure that this works properly with a single qubit and I'm going to excite a second qubit. Uh, this is already a nice piece of work. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, so then there's a really nice question from Essen Nazir who says, is the coherent, so this is related to the definition of work in terms of coherent fraction, right? So is the coherent fraction only first order coherent as in standard resonance fluorescence 
Uh, and is the consideration of higher order cons coherences important at all? So um, I think that was a question when I started defining work and I'm hoping what I presented with the, with the spontaneous scenario enlightened a bit what I meant by coherent fraction. It's actually really the, the overlap of the field that is emitted by the qubit with a coherent field. So I don't really know if we can talk about first or, or higher order coherences. It's, uh, it's defined by the statistics of the field. Yeah, but um, I'd say surely second order coherence is important. I mean, because first order coherence usually just refers to basically frequency. I mean, how sharp you are in frequency. I mean, typically, no. I mean, typically you need a second order coherent function to distinguish between like a filtered thermal state and a coherent state, for example. But, I mean, would you agree with this or? But so here you talk about G1 and G2 yeah, and how exactly. correlated we are. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, G1 and G2 may carry information, but I would say the best uh, observable that uh, we have at our disposal to measure this kind of stuff is the homodyning and heterodyning measurements. It's really, we are going to let the field emitted by the dipole beat with a coherent field mm -hmm. uh, that is. Uh, yeah, that is uh, resonant with the qubit, and see uh, uh, what remains. So that, sure. that's that's homodyning protocol that is better fitted. Sure. Okay. I see. So basically, you're saying that you need you don't want to do photon counting measurements at all. You want to basically measure with homodyne. I mean, that's that's kind of the point, right? Do you want to? I think that's the most yeah. natural. Uh, then, mm -hmm. then it depends on the experimentalist, and uh, sure. uh, I would say we can adapt. Uh, the, the, the battery <laughs> sure. of, uh, of operation and transformation we can do, but homodyning is much better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's really interesting for me as well. So thanks for the question, Essen. Um, so now, okay, let me move on because we still have lots of questions. So Gabriel Langi has uh, three related questions. Uh, okay. So number one, is it possible to quantify experimentally how non-ideal is the work extraction process due to the entangling nature of the interaction? Uh, so is uh, referring to uh, part of the process I didn't mention, which is the transient regime. While the qubit is still entangled with the field that, he, that it is emitting. For yeah. instance, in the spontaneous scenario, in the spontaneous scenario, I start from a well-defined state of my qubit and then it's going to radiate. It's entangling with the field, and then at some point the field is uh, the, the qubit is back is the, in the ground state, and it's not entangled anymore. And and um, so actually, sorry, so I the just question is: I Do should, we? Yes, I should I should actually ask all three together. I mean, the question is: Yeah, indeed, you you just explain the context. I mean, can you quantify experimentally how non-ideal it is, and then is there a general method, and how much information would it require? So it's kind of all the same question. I mean, how do you do it, and how hard it would be? Um, sorry. I, I would say it is so. Uh, thank Gabriel for the question because uh, this is something we are currently working on, at least on the modeling part, describing uh, the entanglement of a qubit with a propagating field. And uh, but this is an experimental performance. I want to insist on that. This, this really requires extremely good uh, circuits and extremely good detection efficiency. And uh, so not experimentalists can do that. Uh, because it would require a joint measurement on the atom and a propagating field, basically. Yes, yes. Okay. So basically, this is that what they do in, in Ben's group right I now. See. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I kind of messed up reading the question, Gabriel, but I hope that that answers the question. Um, so uh, another question from, from Junjie. Um, I will get through all of these guys, so don't worry. Um, Junjie says, um, as both scenarios rely on a driving field as input, can the battery store the output field for later use? Say it again. Uh, so as both scenarios, I mean, the question is basically if the battery or the waveguide can store the output field for later use, right? Uh -huh. So, yeah, so indeed in this uh, scenario we proposed, uh, I said the, f the, the, the work extracted should be reusable, but actually it is directly reusable because uh, you, it's enough to put a qubit on the way and, and, and stuff will happen to it. If we wanted to store it, 
uh, meaning we don't want the guy to travel uh, for forever in, in the waveguide, um, it is possible to couple it to a battery and store it in a battery. And this will actually be, be respectful of the statistics. I mean, if there is a coherent fraction in the waveguide and an incoherent fraction, this fraction will be saved while mapping the propagating field into a field stored in a, in a, in a cavity. Sure. So it's possible. Yeah, I mean, you could even use like an EIT medium or something fancy like this, right? If you really want to store it as light, you, yes. could, you could stop the light. Yes. Okay, anyway, sorry, uh, weird ideas. Okay, so let's move on. Um, lots more questions to get through. So uh, Olivia Ezrati says, uh, so from a high level view, what are the use cases of work extraction uh, in, in QC? I guess that means quantum computing, um, yeah. controlling noise or reducing thermal losses or, or something else. So yeah, on top of this, I had promised a, a, a link with quantum computing and I didn't do it actually. <laughs> the talk was already too big, I think. So. Um, Work extraction from a qubit is not a use case per se. What I would say is that Hi. Hi. Sorry, I think we're back up now. Sorry about that, guys. Um, no problem. So, yeah, we got cut off when we were just, when you were just kind of halfway through answering um, the question about quantum computing. As long computing. as it, it, it did not eat the talk, it's okay. <laughs> no, 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 the talk is, it will still be there, don't worry. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, anyway, this is this is normal. So I'm um, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> so yeah, I think you were halfway through the answering Olivia Ezrati's question about quantum computing. Yes, so I, I was saying that, uh, okay, to, to make it provocative, extracting work from a qubit is useless. Right, it's not with this we are going to save the planet, uh, but the idea is to be able to understand how to properly control uh, exchanges of energy and entropy at the, at the quantum level. So we, we need to be able to exchange work if we want. And uh, this can be useful to implement, to optimize gates, quantum gates, uh, with the less possible noise because it means that we only exchange work and no heat. So, yeah. But work extraction is paradigmatic uh, for thermodynamics. That's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, so the next question was from Manuel Odelli. Um, curiosity question here. Any guess of what would happen by using a Q-trit instead of a qubit? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, does it open another resource? Um, well, the waveguide is well adapted to, to studying Qtrit because this guy is broadband. Mm. So, and then what? No, I've, I have no idea. That would be nice to, to, to think about. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you can have more different kinds of coherence there, I guess, right? I mean, Absolutely. between different frequency transitions and so on. Yeah, yeah, play with polarizations and stuff. Mm. So, yeah. Cool. Okay, something to do. Uh, always good to have some more stuff to do. So um, there's a question from Simone Gasparinetti, uh, who says, in a spontaneous case, how can you say the system does not receive work? It clearly did when it was prepared in a coherent superposition, and the phase of the qubit is nothing but the phase of the drive used to prepare it, which was a coherent state. That's an excellent remark. That's an excellent remark. Indeed. Okay. So it's you... not currently receiving work, uh, but it was driven at some point. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, without considering the resource that I used when I prepared the initial state. Very good remark. Okay. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, so there's one more question from uh, Prasanna Venkatesh. Uh, I hope I didn't miss any others. There's lots and lots of people clapping and saying thank you for a nice talk. So um, Prasanna Venkatesh says, thanks for the great talk. Can pulse shaping, so not necessarily square, help in optimizing the work yield, so the yield from work extraction, uh, especially if we take more complex emitters? Yeah, so actually what this is what we did. And I did not show it here because I think there was already too much material, but uh, in the figure four of the paper, 
Uh, we also do um, uh, a pulse shaping and we show that we can increase the, the yield from 0 0.57 to 0, uh, 0 0.7. And uh, by going from the square pulse to uh, something that is more Gaussian. So indeed, this is also, uh, I mean, we, we can recycle all the, everything that we know about stimulated emission in that other framework. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so sorry, Francesco Plastina, I, I realize I missed your question, but um, I actually have a, a related question. Um, because I, have, I think I've got through everybody else's, so I can I can now ask my own question. So there's something that I was really interested in and, and a bit confused about, um, which was related to this question about whether the perfectly um, kind of excited atomic state can produce work. And you said that it doesn't produce any work because the phase of the output state is, is ill-defined. Um, but I mean, if I look at the, the standard description of a laser, then the phase of the output field is also not well defined there. So, I mean, that's ah, okay. quite unsatisfying to me as an explanation. Do, do you see Do you so, see the problem? I mean, the Q so, function looks no, like it, that from a laser Actually, well. I thought you were going to ask a question that I was expecting, but not this one. So <laughs> say it again, <laughs> because I was prepared to answer to something different. OK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So you say, um, but a laser has a phase. Well, I mean, this this depends, right? So this is now entering yeah, possibly into Google a Google paper of Klaus Berner with a convenient fiction. Indeed, yeah, we, I mean, we well, have the and, same references. And many but, many other papers after that, of course. I mean, but yeah, indeed, that that's the one I'm thinking of. So I would say, provided that you fix um, the phase of the laser. I'm elaborating in the same way Mulmer elaborates, actually, because this has to see with what is what is your your reference exactly in the end. Exactly. So you, for instance, I, I insisted a lot on the fact that to measure work, it's important to do a homodyning measurement. Homodyning measurement means that you have a, a reference, a local oscillator, mm -hmm. and actually, uh, this local oscillator. Uh, will be the one that you use also to drive your system. Indeed. And this fixes the phase. So in other words, if you send uh, a laser field on a beam splitter and then uh, takes two paths, one path is used to drive the system and one other path will be, will be used to do the local oscillator to do the homodyning. And in that case, the laser does the job. Indeed. Does it answer, it, what, does it answer kind of, your question? I mean, I, I would add that arguably that's just a relative phase, of course, and that actually the laser. But I mean, I guess the point I'm making is that, I mean, this whole discussion shows, I mean, the, you, you can use a laser to do useful things, even though you don't know its phase at the beginning. So irrespective of the philosophical question of whether or not a laser has yes. its phase, we all agree that without a reference frame, the correct description is, is a phase average state but we can still yeah. use such a state to do useful operations. So I'm wondering, surely you can use this kind of single photon state um, to do something useful in the same way that you could use a, a laser. It's Absolutely. just got less photons. Absolutely, because, uh, but here it's a philosophical question about uh, does work uh, erase the possible operations, uh, but erase, consumes all the possible operations, uh, useful operations that we can do. and. Clearly, the answer is not, because I could also send my photon and use it to, to impinge a mirror, and I get, and, and this also transfers work. So, uh, you see, it's more in the sense that the field that my qubit is going to radiate, is it possible that part of this field induces a coherent component and a unitary evolution? Yes. Which is a very restricted uh, class of useful operations which correspond to a transfer of energy without transfer of entropy. So you're saying that that single photon state couldn't ever in induce a, a coherent rotation on, other, on another system? No, because if you look at what's going on in the block sphere, when the single photon is absorbed by the qubit, it will be partially absorbed. So you could say, oh, it, it, it gives energy, so what's the problem? It's, it's work, but no, because uh, actually, it doesn't do any unitary. So to, to go towards the excited state, it goes uh, through the interior uh, of the block ball. So you create entropy at the same time. 
Yeah, but exactly. I think a Poisson distribution of, of number states would also be described like that. And yet, arguably, that's what a laser is. Anyway, I mean, sorry, this is probably yeah, going mean, to... I don't want to no, drag this out, but it's super interesting. Because I was not expecting to have quantum op opticians in sorry. front of me. And, uh, <laughs> no, that's cool. <laughs> Maybe we can discuss this uh, another time. I'm With sorry pleasure. to hijack the discussion with everyone, <laughs> um, but it's really interesting. I, it would be cool to, to maybe discuss this more because I'd like to understand it better. OK, but anyway, um, let's let's move away from that. And I think um, I hope that I got all of the questions from everyone. Um, and so um, let's maybe conclude here. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in, as always. And especially thank you so much, Professor Alexia Ofev, for a really clear and interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.